This episode is brought to you by Adam, Steve and Marcy, and William, this week's newest patrons. This one might make some people angry, but you guys know when the thumbnail says not to buy something, I usually talk about why you actually should. Remember the don't buy a hunter? But this time is different. There is actually a really good reason not to look at what is one of the darlings of the cruising sailboat world. This week on everything you need to know why you shouldn't buy an island packet. Before we get started today, for those of you who don't know, I started a second YouTube channel. It's called History, and it's all about maritime history. If you're into that, I just posted the third episode. It's about the disasters of Niagara Falls. I think it's pretty cool. I'll leave a link in the description, and I'd love for you to check it out. It's springtime. The warm weather's finally here. It's all rolling in, and a lot of people are buying sailboats right now, and I've been doing a lot of consulting, helping people buy boats. And we always start with the buyer telling me what's important to them in a boat. And one of the more common scenarios that I get is that they want something a bit more traditional, very, very strong and comfortable in a big sea, an ocean capable in case they want to take a longer voyage. Often the budget they give me is about 150 grand US, and that paints a pretty specific list of boats. In that top three on that list, you'll always find Island Packet. Island Packet might be the most cult following sailboat ever made. The company started in Florida in 1979 by naval architect Bob Johnson, and it's a unique brand because it's one of the only successful boat manufacturers of the time that never changed the goal of the boats. They never changed the recipe. Bob set out to build specifically boats with superior quality and a heavy focus on safety and comfort at sea. And now 40 years later, they're still doing exactly the same thing. Top notch quality in a boat that you can take out in proper blue water and you can beat the hell out of it and still come home safely. The legacy of Island Packet as a brand can't be overstated. IP owners often own their boats for decades and the factory is so confident in the designs that if you have an older Island Packet, you can bring it in for a price and they'll refit the whole thing for you and bring it up to speed. Didn't have in-mast reefing back when the boat was made? No problem, we've got a whole new rig for you. Didn't have electric winches or windlass? No problem, here you go. Island Packet markets itself as a boat that'll basically last as long as you will. And the pedigree. Anytime someone questions whether or not a boat can cross an ocean, I always say, let's look at where we find them for sale. Now, a great example of this is a company called Bayfield, a little sailboat brand made in Canada that you'll routinely find models of for sale in the US, in Europe, or even Australia. So is it blue water? I'm going to go with a resounding yes. And a quick scope of the island packets for sale. And yep, a Florida made boat in French Polynesia, in Spain, in the UK, in Italy, Malta, and even Croatia. These boats are everywhere because they can sail everywhere. In fact, they have sailed everywhere. But no one's perfect, and Island Packet does have its share of haters for a couple of specific reasons. And we're going to start with a small one, and we're going to end on the most distressing one. While I have you guys, if you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Both things are free for you, and they would really mean the world to me. The first thing people hate on is the cost of island packets. These boats tend to be tens of thousands of dollars more expensive than their perceived competition. For example, here is an island packet 440. This is from 2008. It's a beautiful boat. And by the way, the 440 is my favorite island packet. The price on these is about 350,000 US dollars. Now, here's the same sized Beneteau Oceanus from the same year for literally half the price. Same size, same year, and for 90% of people, the same experience. The difference is the build quality and the capability of these boats. 
Island Packet was built thicker, heavier, and beefier all around with stronger hardware and a tougher rig, and genuinely made to cross oceans, while that Veneto was built to rocket around the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and a bit more of a luxurious trim level. Which one would I want to be on at anchor? Easy, the Beneteau. Which one do I want to be on offshore in a 4.7 gale? The answer seems obvious, but yes, they are more expensive. But the resale seems to hold pretty well too. The second complaint that people tend to have about island packets is that they're sort of slow. And sure, that's kind of valid. The island packet gets its superior comfort and safety from being heavy and having a very big keel. And yes, it's overbuilt, and the term brick outhouse comes to mind. And you do pay for that in the performance department. The added wetted surface and the weight does make you less maneuverable than a fin keel boat, and it means that you're not going to be clipping through eight knots of speed very often. But is that really the goal with a boat like this? No, not really. But the third problem, and by far and away the biggest point in this episode, I did a consult with a with a guy a few days ago, and he was looking for just this sort of thing. And he basically, we started the call and he said, Tim, I need you to ruin this boat for me. And I didn't know what we were looking at yet. Now, you see, he was pretty dead set on buying a specific boat, but he wanted to make darn sure that he wasn't wasting his money or overlooking some critical issue that he didn't think of. So he sent me the link to the boat and I opened it and I found myself staring at a properly handsome and very well equipped 1998 Island Packet. And that's where things sort of got ruined. The 1990s Island Packets, like all Island Packets, are robust and extremely capable ocean cruisers with excellent interior layouts and craftsmanship inside that is second to none. But if you're looking at an Island Packet made before the 2000s, we need to talk about chain plates. Chain plates, if you don't know, are the anchor that ties your standing rigging, the wires that hold your mast up, to the hull of the boat. Here are some external chain plates to give you an idea of how they work and where they fit into things. If the chain plate fails, the mast might come down, so it's a pretty important piece of kit. In the very early years, we used bronze for chain plates, and while it had a habit of turning green, it was very well suited to the job. But in more recent years, through the 60s and 70s, we started using stainless steel. And this is where things get very, very important. The stainless steel used in the day, we have to get a little technical, was a grade 304. And 304 is extremely strong really easy to work with too when you're manufacturing it and it's easy to polish it up to a nice shine. It seemed like the perfect material for chain plates for a while. It wasn't until those boats with the 304 grade of stainless were turning 20 or 25 years old that we found that the 304 was failing. The 304 is wonderful and strong but it has some weaknesses. In particular, it's susceptible to corrosion over time, and in particular in oxygen-deprived environments. And that plays a critical role in the story of Island Packet. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make these videos possible. A big shout out to the existing patrons that have gotten us this far. I couldn't do it without you. Um, if you'd like to help out or you get some value from the channel, please consider becoming a patron. Around the same time that we were switching from bronze to stainless steel, manufacturers also stopped putting external chain plates on most boats, and they started putting them inside the hull. Cosmetics, really. And not a huge problem, but further, some manufacturers started to encapsulate the chain plates entirely in fiberglass. And looking back, we know now that was kind of a terrible idea. Not just because it caused the grade 304 stainless steel to corrode more quickly, but there's an even bigger problem when you encase them in fiberglass. It's a nightmare, actually. You could no longer see them. You could no longer inspect them. So if it was corroded, which the 304 was doing, and your mast was at risk of falling down, there was no way to know until the mast fell down. Now, Island Packet wasn't the only brand doing the encapsulation, however. The folks over at Choi Lee did it too, as well as other brands like Irwin and CT and Formosa. Now, I don't think Island Packet is to blame here either because we just didn't know better at the time, but Island Packet is the one that most people remember because 
Well, most boats have one chain plate for every shroud, so typically three on each side of the boat. Island Packet used one long bar for three chain plates, effectively making the chain plate all one piece. So when it failed, the whole thing failed. We learned in the 90s, and Island Packet and other major manufacturers were pretty quick to make changes. A newer grade of stainless steel was available in the mid-90s called 304L, and it was a little bit better, so everybody was switching to that in the late 90s. It wasn't until 1999 that they finally transitioned to the much stronger and much preferred 316 stainless steel, and that material has been switched in pretty much every boat now. So if you're interested in a pre-1999 island packet, you really have to think about it. Before we get to what you should do if you're looking at one of those boats, it should be noted that since the switch to 316 stainless in around the year 2000, not a single premature failure has been documented through island packet. So what do you do when you're looking at an older island packet where the chain plates have not been replaced? There's no evidence of it. It's a very tough question because there is no right answer other than to simply replace all of them immediately. Also, there's no real way to inspect them because not only are they hidden behind all the beautiful cabinetry inside an island packet, which you don't want to cut up, they're also encapsulated in thick fiberglass. Now, people have in attempted inspections with ultrasounds and x-rays, but since you're looking for the most minute amount of corrosion, it's almost impossible to really be sure of anything without completely ripping them apart. And since the price of being wrong is potentially dismasting, you can't really roll the dice on this, but there are some solutions. There's a money's no object solution, and you can have all of the chain plates on the boat replaced. And the industry standard for that is undoubtedly Mack Yacht Service in Florida. They are the go-to folks for this job and most things Island Packet, most things chain plates. Second to none as far as all my research shows. But the last quote I saw from Mac to do eight chain plates on an Island Packet was just shy of $18,000. Now 18 grand is obviously a lot of money, but if it's say a $150,000 boat and the seller is willing to come down on the price at least half of that 18,000, you could be the proud owner of an extremely capable world-class ocean boat with brand new chain plates made with the right steel, 316. And then you'd never really have to worry about chain plates again, which would be kind of a nice feeling. Another solution is to save a few bucks and go back in time a little bit. We used to use external chain plates on everything and mounting external chain plates on the island packet hull doesn't change the geometry of the rig enough to really matter. Most of the time it's around an inch and a half more outboard than the original was, so you don't even have to change the length of the rigging. Now this has been done on a lot of island packets to solve this problem, so you're not going to be really reinventing the wheel if you want to go to external chain plates. But the last quote I saw for somebody having that done and done properly was some $13,000. And mind you, that's done extremely well. The materials are just very, very expensive. So did I hold true to the thumbnail? Should you not buy an island packet? I think the answer is not a hard no, but the answer is also you need to know what you're doing before you buy one. Understanding the timeline of the models and like buying anything, the cost to bring it up to operating standards if it is a boat made before the year 2000. I get a lot of requests like that too from folks that are boat shopping, so I dedicated a page over at ladykaysailing.com where you can go to book an hour of my time if you need my help. It's ladykaysailing.com forward slash consults. And if you want to join in on the conversation, we have a great group of people chatting over on the Lady K Discord channel. I'll leave a link below if you want to check it out. Until next time, guys, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. Mm -hmm.